we're going to read a story from um, Joshua chapter 10. If we could go to that, um, you might recognize this, this name, Adonai Zedek. Um, what, if you've read, the, if you've read uh, the Old Testament, is there another person's name who sounds like that one? What? what? Yeah. Melchizedek. Right. Well, actually, this guy's name probably was borrowed from Melchizedek because he was the king of Jerusalem and Melchizedek was the king of Salem, which is, later became Jerusalem. Okay, so Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured and completely destroyed Ai and killed its king, just as he had destroyed the town of Jericho and killed its king. He also learned that the Gibeonites had made peace with Israel and were now their allies. He and his people became very afraid when they heard, and I've got this clicker so I can do it, um, uh, heard all this. Because Gibeon was a large town, as large as the royal cities and larger than I. And the Gibeonite men were strong warriors. So King Adonai Zedek, I got this camera in the road and I've got to do the dance, of Jerusalem sent messengers to several other kings, Hoham, oh, good name, of Hebron, Piram of Jarmoth and Japhia of Lachish and Dibia of Eglon. Boy, oh boy, I really need to work on my Hebrew <laughs> pronunciations. <laughs> Come and help me destroy Gibeon, he urged them, for they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. So these five Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack. They moved all their troops into place and attacked Gibeon. Hmm, interesting. The five men of Gibeon uh, five men of Gibeon quickly sent managers, oh, the men of Gibeon uh, quickly sent messengers to Joshua at his camp in Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants now, they pled. Please come at once, save us, help us, for the, all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. So Joshua and his entire army, including his best warriors, left Gilgal and set out for Gibeon. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua. For I have given you victory over them. Not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. And Joshua traveled all night from Gilgal and took the Amorite armies by surprise. And the Lord threw them into a panic and the Israelites slaughtered great numbers of them at Gibeon. Then the Israelites chased the enemy along the road to Beth Horon, killing them all along the way to Azekar Az and Makedar. There's some more. And the, as the Amorites retreated down the road from Beth Horon, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Azekar. And the hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. On, the day, on that day, the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites. And Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. And he said, Let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon at the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. Is this event not recorded in the book of Joshua? The sun stayed in the middle of the sky and it did not set on a normal day. We're not going to talk about the hailstones and we're not going to talk about the sun not moving, but there is some interesting information on that scientifically. Um, but what we're going to concentrate is... Um, on, uh, I'm just going to go to, to this, on covenant. Um, in chapter 9 of Joshua, the Gibeonites have heard about all the things that God had done for Israel and all the other kings had done the same and they were afraid and the Gibeonites were afraid. They were afraid that what had happened to Jericho, what had happened to all the kings on the other side of the Jordan was about to happen to them and they would be wiped out. They believed in the stories they heard. And in chapter 9, they actually were so scared they wanted to save their own skin, but they also believed that it's better to be on God's side and be saved than it is to be against him. All the other kings said, let's fight. Gibeon said, what are we going to do? And they said, well, let's come up with a plan. We've got to save ourselves. This God will do what he's, going to, what he's done. He's going to do to us. And they believed that. And they went there to ask for mercy because they wanted to be on God's side. And, you know, there's, there's two stories there. One is, is the deception. 
Uh, the story of deception. And I, I learned a lot from, from this story. Uh, how many people read it and got stuff out of it? Um, both sides. There's two sides to this story. One is the deception and our enemies will seek to either confront us and front on and, some will, and sometimes he will deceive us. Uh, what's really interesting is the deception was very similar to what the, uh, our enemy Satan does with Jesus in, in the wilderness. In that the enemy often uses scripture. He'll actually sound reasonable sounding arguments to us to, to deceive us, to get us not to trust God, but to trust words, to trust the law. And so, you know, uh, turn these stones into bread. Jesus is fasting. The temptation is to eat something and break his fast. And Jesus said, um, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. I'm fasting. I want God. I don't need food right now. I want to obey my, my, my desire to put God's word first. I'm not listening to you. So what happened in the story of Joshua 9 is that the people uh, that Joshua was, um, was deceived by a deception that relied on information that the Gibeonites had learned about the law given to Israel. You know what the law said in Deuteronomy? It says you can't make any treaties or covenants with any of the people in the Canaanites, only far nations. Do you know what the Gibeonites did? Somehow they heard about that and they said, the only way we're going to get out of this is to pretend to be from a far nation because they're allowed to make treaty with them. You know what I also learned from that story from Night Church? Night Church used this expression. We had breakout groups and we talked about it and someone said, Joshua had all these red flags that, you know, all these questions over what they were saying, whether it was true or not, and he ignored them all. Did any, does anybody relate to that? Have you ever been into a situation where the Holy Spirit is saying, uh-uh, 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 and you go, oh, no, no, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, no, no, it's all right. That seems rational. That's fair. That's good. And you're ignoring this red flag that's, or the red light or the, I don't know what it is in you. It's the uh-uh. For me, it's the uh-uh feeling. Has anybody ever had an uh-uh feeling from the Holy Spirit? Have you ever ignored it? Have you ever paid for ignoring it? Oh, boy, that is dumb. <laughs> I, have, I have a way of discerning uh, you know, I try to feed on the word of God so that my hearing of the Spirit's voice is, is, is sensitive and subtle and s supple. It's, it's ready. But I surround myself uh, with wise counselors. That's another one. But I want to hear the God's voice. And so here's, I've got a traffic light way. Red, red signals mean no in a traffic light terms. Green signals mean, amber signals mean, Technically, they mean prepare to stop. In that, if you go to your driver's manual, how many taught their kids to drive recently? It means prepare to stop. It does not mean prepare to go. Go faster. It'll go faster. <laughs> how many of you? It's I've got to get through. <laughs> prepare. So what I've learned is, if the Holy Spirit's saying red light, I don't go there. If he's saying go green light, right? Even if everything doesn't seem right, even if it seems scary and uncertain, if he's got this underlying green, I can have all the reasons why I shouldn't, and people can tell me all the reasons I shouldn't, but if God is saying go, then I go scared. But I do not go when it's amber. I wait on the Lord. Because oftentimes we can confuse amber for green and think, I need to just get through. But I would encourage you, that's where you go to your wise counsellors. That's when you wait on the Lord. That's when you go to Scripture and say, Lord, it, it seems uncertain right now. I need you. If it's going to be green with a little bit of scared, I'd rather that than go when I'm not supposed to go.
I don't want anybody to get paralysed by decision making in that, that thing. Just It's better to wait on the Lord a little bit longer. So uh, in that story, Joshua got hurried. They're going, we want a treaty, we want a treaty. Oh, right, okay, right. Well, it, it all seems good to me and to everybody else, but it says Joshua didn't. He didn't seek the counsel of the Lord. However, here's what's really cool about that story. Did God know in advance what was about to happen? <laughs> Did God want Gibeon to have a treaty with Israel, even though they were Canaanites? On one level, he said, don't make a treaty. On another level, these people were desperate. What does God do? He let mercy triumph over how good is God? He desperate. God responds to humility and repentance and the Gibeonites showed what that looks like to me. Do you know what? What I want to talk to you about today is I feel like people who are not Christians are like the Gibeonites and I was, was not a Christian and I'm assuming that many of you are Christians and you once were not Christians. Maybe some of you are not yet Christians. But the Gibeonites faced the living God and his might and his power. And instead of fighting it or trying to escape it, they came humbly seeking mercy and said, we want to be a part of you. We don't want to fight you. And I think God wants to bring everybody to that place where they humbly recognise what he's done for them. And they stop trying to fix their own brokenness and they stop trying to fill their own emptiness and they go, God, I cannot do this. I, need, I cannot make myself right with you. And they come and they ask for mercy. Here's what I know from Joshua 10, um, verse 1 to 5, that our enemy hates people coming into covenant with God his peace, his protection, and his provision. Um, anybody a, a Christian within the last two years here who's become a Christian in the last two years? Anybody? Jazz, is that true for you? He doesn't like you being in covenant, does he? Has he tried really hard to get you to break your covenant with God? Yeah, he hates it. But that's true for all of us. He hates you just as much as he hates jazz. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Your God loves him, loves you far more than he hates you. And his love is greater than his hate. And God is so good. What I want to talk to you about this morning, and I've got a very little time to do it, is about covenant. Um, really good little section. If you go to the Bible Project, Dot com and uh, go to the, their description of covenant. It actually gives you a really beautiful description of all the covenants in the, in the uh, Bible and it actually explains some of the how this, what I've just shared with you, connects to covenant. And I don't have time to do that. I'm just going to give you a simple rundown on what is a covenant. Covenant's not a word that we use today. It's um, in that video, it describes it as a partnership. A partnership. Um, and um, But it. I would also use the words, it's an unbreakable promise. It's an unbreakable promise. So what is a covenant? It's an unbreakable promise only broken by death or unfaithfulness. Um, we, we do not do well on covenants. We do not do well on promises. Even in the business world, contracts are almost... <sighs> do, you, do you know what I'm... When I just breathed out... You know, the contracts that we have with people are just taken so glibly and they're so easily broken. It's no wonder that our marriage covenant um, is not taken seriously in our community. Christian or not Christian, uh, the percentage of people that get divorced is 50, um, around, or was around 50%. Um, the reality for all of us is that we... Uh, there can be reasons people break their, their uh, covenant with their husband or wife. It could be through death or it could be through marital unfaithfulness. 
But sometimes people just go, yeah, I just don't love them anymore. Oh, I've changed my mind. I thought I loved them, no, I didn't. Now I don't. It's too hard. But that's true on every level, right? It's just easy to opt out. It's easy to opt out. But the promises that God makes are not like that. And he made those promises with us. And he asked us to be a people like him, to be holy as he is holy. So when he says, I make a promise, I keep a promise. Now, the truth is, all of us break promises, right? So don't get... If you've broken promises, right, what have you got access to? When you fail in your promises, what have you got access to? Forgiveness and mercy. If, you, if you're hearing my words today and it sounds like judgment's coming on you because you've broken promises, can I remind you that I stand here as a person who's broken promises? If you've broken promises, welcome to the crew. The reality is not that we are called to keep the promises, but the, the Bible tells us when you break your promises, when you do not keep God's perfect design, because he is perfect, he never breaks his promises, but when you do, there is a way out. There is forgiveness. There is a way to go and be restored by God, and God's done that. But God, his promises, he makes. They're, they're unbreakable when he calls us. Take those promises seriously. Um, what, what is a covenant? It's made by someone greater and someone lesser. So when I do the marriage covenant with a couple, I always remind them, God is the greater and the more powerful person and his desire in this covenant is for your marriage to work. And he will do everything. He will move heaven and earth and give you all the resources you need to make it work. If your partner uh, does something wrong, if your partner is sick, if your partner is having a hard time or weak, he can give you all the resources you need to love that partner as you love yourself. What is a covenant? Well, it has a go-between. It's always somebody who mediates, who always gets in between. In this case, the first case, the old covenant was done with Moses. In, this, in, in the new covenant that Christians have, it was done with Jesus. Jesus brokered the peace. What is a covenant? Uh, it, it is sealed by blood. Um, the word in the Old Testament talks about cutting a covenant. It's this idea that an animal's life is taken and its body is sacrificed and its blood is used to bring about a connection and a union and a partnership. In the Old Testament, it was a lamb or the blood of bulls. Um, and in, in the New Testament, it's the lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sins of the world. It's always sealed by blood. It's always marked by blood. Um, why did we need a new covenant? People need to understand there are three reasons. The first one is that the sin and guilt offering that, that God had the Israelites given uh, with the blood of animals was insufficient. And the writer of Hebrews actually talked about this. He said, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sin. That, that offering was good until you sinned and then you had to go back and have another offering. So yearly they'd have to go back and cover the sin of the years past. So they were constantly going back to the temple for forgiveness. It was still mercy and it was still grace, but it was only temporary. Second of all, there was no power to help them obey the covenant. It was basically, this is my covenant, obey it. And so they would write it down, they would remember it, they would recall it, they would talk about it, they would commit to it, but they didn't have this broken thing in them fixed. Humanity has this thing that says, I want to do my own thing. That wasn't fixed. And the other thing was, we didn't have God's spirit living in us. They didn't have God's spirit living in them to actually help them do what God asked. And thirdly, it says there in Deuteronomy 30, uh, speaking of the future, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul and live. That was something that was coming. That was what Messiah would do. He would, he would change our hearts. In Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, we learn that God would take out our old heart of stone and give us a new heart. He would, take out, uh, he would give us his spirit so that we, his, 
His word will be written on our hearts. And finally, the third reason the old covenant, uh, while we needed a new covenant, was that the first was only temporary. In Hebrews 8 it says, In speaking of a new covenant, he, God, makes the first one, the old one, obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So God looked ahead and he's going, I've got this, this way of doing it once and for all. I want the covenant to last forever and ever. And it's not going to be temporary. And I need to, to know that your sins, it might, the people under this new covenant will know their sins are forgiven past, present and future. Don't you love the fact that you can wake up every morning knowing that you, you can be assured that God has covered all the things you did yesterday? And everything you do today that doesn't meet his perfect design, he's got that covered. And here's what's beautiful. He's got me covered for tomorrow. I don't even know about it. It's so good. So who's the new covenant between? Well, it's between God and all who believe in his son, Jesus Christ. And for New Testament believers, when um, they were writing uh, Romans and the books like that, they were talking to mainly Jewish Christians. But then we know that Simon... Um, Peter went to Cornelius and Gentiles got started to become Christians and God was entering the covenant with all these people who were not Jews. And we know now that God's new covenant is with Jews and Gentiles, at first with Jews and then with Gentiles. So I'm a Gentile, I'm not a Jewish person, uh, but that covenant is good for me. And we know that because um, uh, Jesus has come for all um, and what is promised? Forgiveness and peace with God. For I will forgive their wickedness and he will remember their sins no more. He promises the Holy Spirit, his presence and his power. We know that um, Joel 2 talks about this, that God would come and his pres- his, he would fill us with his spirit and people would prophesy. We know that his presence would be with us now in Revelation 21. We have this beautiful picture of the eternal kingdom and God is with his people and we are, we, we are his people and he is our God. His presence is dwelling in me now, dwelling in you if you're a believer, but he's going to dwell with us inside and externally. I don't know about you, but I love the fact that I'll be with God forever and God is with me forever. And finally, how do we enter into peace with God? How do we enter into this new covenant? Well, We first of all humble ourselves, we repent, we turn from sin to God, we put our faith in Jesus, his death to forgive your sins and his rising again to give you new and eternal life. What Jesus did on the cross was the blood that sealed this covenant. He's the greater one. He comes and he says, I will make a new covenant. And Luke, when we remember the Lord's Supper, where we have the bread and the wine, they're symbols. And Jesus said, this is the new cup of my new covenant made in my blood. He was actually welcoming them into something brand new, the disciples. And those disciples would make disciples who would make disciples who would make disciples. And guess what? You're all the results of those disciples going out and telling people how good this new covenant partnership, unbreakable promise with God is. I'm going to finish by saying um, the rest of the story in Joshua 10 is a story of God never letting go of his promise to Gibeon. God will stop at nothing to keep his covenant with us. God, uh, so the enemies of Israel decide to pick on Gibeon because they have become traitors. They were Canaanites once, and now they've treated with Israel. So instead of picking on Israel, they go for the weakest link. They go for this newly isolated nation, and they go, we're out for you. Joshua actually had an opportunity, technically, to go, we can get back at the Gibeonites 
They deceived us. What could he have done? Technically. He could have said, they deceived us. We won't kill them. Let their own kill them. But you see, if you, if you go back to the law given to them, they were told that those who come in become a part of them. They come under the providence, protection and the peace of God. Joshua is a man of the word and a man of the spirit. And he knew that he could have gone by the technical letter of the law, but he said, no, God has allowed these people grace. We, they are ours. They are our responsibility. So he, off he goes to fight. He, he, he takes his army to confront these armed forces. He walks all night long. That's determination, right? That's saying, God, this is important. As he goes, what does God tell him? I'm going to give every one of them into your hands, Joshua. You know, Joshua is the same name that Jesus. Jesus marches out in front of his people and says, they are mine. I know the enemy's out to get them. I am, I am fighting for them. Listen, you are not alone. You have an enemy and he tries to either hit you front on or deceive you on the side. But either way, your warrior commander of the Lord's army is Jesus and he's doing the fighting for you. You need to understand that he is greater than he in you than he that is in the world. You need to understand for this purpose, the son of God was realized, was manifest to destroy the works of the evil one. You are not, just because you are being attacked does not mean you are alone. It doesn't mean that God has forgotten that you're being attacked. What he does is he says, when you're being attacked, trust me. Call on my name. Know that I am greater than your enemy. So all of us get attacked. All of us get tempted. All of us face trial. I was, I've just been through, and we are still going through to somewhat, a somewhat of a trial with Michelle's broken leg. It was not easy. Deb, Brian, how easy is dealing with your broken leg? <laughs> no. It's exhausting. There are days, there are good days and there are bad days. And your flesh hates the bad days. Isn't it so good when things are easy? You don't question anything. But when you are under trial, your faith gets tested and the enemy knows it. And so he throws temptations and accusations and he throws... Do you, how do you think I've done? Like all of you, I've had good days and I've had bad days. But what have I had to do? When I failed, what did I have to do? First of all, I had to ask Michelle, I'm sorry. I did this. I lost my temper. Oh, Paul, you didn't lose your temper, did you really? Not you, you're a pastor. I could never follow someone that would lose their temper. Actually, I'm not really, I'm not one for losing my temper. It's more of getting huffy. <laughs> Having attitude. A bad attitude. You know, acting all like the victim. Hmm. It's not what I say, it's how I say it. I'm not relating to any of you here, am I? You're never like that. None of you have two. My God saw my situation. And he was saying, when you fail, I want you to acknowledge it. I will forgive you and restore you and make a better way. But I need you to be on guard because your enemy is scheming. He's scheming. He wants you to live by what you see and what you hear. And he doesn't want you to walk by the Spirit. The Spirit denies our feelings. It denies what seems right in our own eyes. It, it, the Spirit says, stop thinking that your rights are everything and, and then starts looking at what, what is good for the other person. So in this trial, the enemies had a go. Has that been easy? I don't know about you. It's never easy. Joshua was sent to fight on behalf of the Gibeonites and he walked all through the night and then battled all day long 
And then God sent hailstorm, which was a miraculous intervention. And then Joshua knew that God had told him he's going to give everyone in their hand and they still hadn't wiped them out. And so he said, Lord, make the day longer so that we can get everyone. And then he fought all day long. How tired do you reckon they were fighting? You know, our walk in this life is a fight. But we, if, we, we, if we try to fight without God, we are gone. Because then we become weak and we become vulnerable and God says then you can get taken out. So don't fight the enemy in your own resources. Go back to the Lord. Wait on his words. Take his words seriously. Surround yourself with fellow soldiers of the faith. Fight with them. When you're in a tight spot, get people to pray for you. Uh, don't try to do it alone. Isolation is the enemy's greatest delight. But God will stop at nothing to keep his covenant with us. I love the fact that this, this I'm, and I'm finishing now, I love the fact that the Gibeonites represent me, represent us before we knew Jesus. There are people who were under judgment. There are people who are far away from God. They were living with things being their God. They served other gods. They, 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 they were not part of God's kingdom plan. And yet when they humbled self and they turned and they came and they knelt before and asked for mercy, God, through Joshua, was able to give them mercy. And not only that, then God included them from that moment on in the people of Israel and said, you're my people and now I will fight for you. And that God, your God, has doing that and has done that and will continue to do that to the day you die. You are his people. He will fight for you. He will fight with you and he will cause you to take down your enemies. Chris, oh, yeah, that's another word. It's they became water carriers and carriers of wood for the the altar and for the washing. And there's something prophetic about that. Maybe you can think about that. How God made them into a people that would be connected to making other people right. Think about those things. Let's pray. Jesus, thanks for coming to earth. I say that and those words sound so trite, but I'm so grateful that you came to earth and made a covenant with those who would believe. Thank you for giving yourself you stopped at nothing to come and to make people who are not right, right. People who are aliens and strangers from your kingdom and you welcomed them into your kingdom and said, you're mine. But even more, you called us children. You gave us the same. You gave us the same beautiful riches that were in Jesus and you said you can have what's his. I'm so grateful for your goodness to me. I'm so grateful that what a friend I have in Jesus, all my sins and griefs to bear. I'm, God, what a privilege it's to carry everything to you in prayer. That's the covenant I'm walking in, God. You put your spirit in me. Put your spirit in us. So You help us to obey your commands. Oh, your presence lives in us and then it fills us with a life that's eternal. God, we're so grateful. Thank you for your abundant mercy. So Lord, as we leave this place, I send these people out knowing, with the knowledge that they carry water, the living water. And you carry the wood that will create a fire, a consuming fire. A fire that is for living sacrifices. May the Lord use your living sacrifice. May the Lord descend upon you with his mercy. May you go blessed to bless others. 
under the covenant of Abraham with all people that through you all the nations will be blessed. Amen. If you'd like to, if you never, if you, if you said, yes, I believe that, but you've never done that, please come and talk to me. I'd love to pray with you. Um, go to the resource section, learn how to do that. And I'd love you to come up to me and say, Pastor Paul, can I have a go? We would love to have people to have a go at doing the three circles. And we, um, Brad's actually going to arrange one of our young fellas who did the three circles last week. He's going to video record it and show you that if a year six kid can do it, you can do it. God bless you.